Hello, I'm Yoram Chazoni, and this is NatCon Talk, where nationalism and conservatism meet. Today, I'll be speaking with Richard Legutko. He's had a distinguished career in Polish politics with the ruling Law and Justice Party, and he's the co-chair of the European Conservatives and Reformists Group in the European Parliament. At the same time, he's a professor of philosophy at Jagiellonian University in Krakow, and recently made a splash in America with his extraordinary book, The Demon in Democracy, Totalitarian Temptations in Free Societies. And we're meeting him now, just as his new book, The Cunning of Freedom, goes to press. Richard Legutko, welcome to NatCon Talk. Hello, it's good to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's a, it's a pleasure to have you. Uh, we actually have a tremendous number of things that we need to cover. Uh, you have a uh, famous, maybe notorious book from a few years ago called uh, The Demon and Democracy, and a new book coming out a few weeks now, the, a few weeks from now, the, the Cunning of Freedom. And I'd like to get to both of those books, but before we do, uh, in addition to being a professor of philosophy and uh, an author of important works of political theory, you're also a practical politician. You're involved in the Polish Law and Justice Party, and uh, and more recently, you, you're playing a leading role uh, in the ECR, the uh, the uh, European Conservatives uh, and Reformists Party. So before we get to the books, I'd like to talk about your political activities. Let's talk about law and justice. Uh, law and justice is the uh, has been for a number of years the 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 ruling. Uh, party in Poland. It's the government of Poland, uh, a conservative party. And uh, in uh, America and in other countries, we hear more and more about the Law and Justice Party uh, because uh, the, the media finds it convenient, I, I, I believe, to, uh, to depict law and justice as uh, so, some kind of authoritarian or proto-fascist Kind of uh, a kind of a party. For example, uh, just a few days ago, uh, uh, Vice President Joe Biden, uh, the Democratic candidate for president in the United States, uh, spoke about the Law and Justice Party in Poland, your party, and uh, referred to it as uh, as uh, totalitarian. Uh, this is the kind of thing that that we in other countries hear all the time, but from uh, from my contact with you and others, uh, my impression is that it's somewhat different. Obviously, uh, the, the Tories in the UK would not have been sitting all those years in the same coalition with law and justice if they thought that you were a, fa a, a fascistic or authoritarian party. But tell us from from your perspective, you, you've, you've served in law and justice governments, you were a minister, uh, a number of years ago, Minister of Education. What, what does the Law and Justice Party stand for in your opinion, from your perspective? Mm -hmm. uh, Law and Justice, I would say, is one of the two conservative, part, conservative parties in Europe, except uh, Hungarian feeders, and, and a successful one. I mean, there are, of course, small parties here and there but without any political influence. But the problem with us is not what we do, but what we are. Uh, we are treated as an alien body. Uh, that's a, a result of the particular uh, tendency in Western politics of the last uh, decades. Uh, if I can make a more abstract argument, I mean, traditionally, there was the, the political life was animated by a division between the political left and the political right. And uh, the, the elections were uh, a contest, right? Who will win, whether the left or the, or the right? Now, that has changed at some point of European history. If you look at political parties uh, in Western Europe, you cannot find much of a difference between the socialists and the and the conservatives. I mean, look like look at German uh, politics or French politics or Spanish uh, politics, even British politics. I would say, same-sex marriage was introduced by 
the socialists in France, by the conservatives in Britain, and by the coalition of all parties in Germany, as is usually the case in Germany. I mean, that's the, the country of the grand coalition. So uh, I'm telling you all this to make you aware that uh, the, the people in, in, in Western Europe uh, are no longer used to uh, a conservative option. They see it as something uh, abnormal. That's an anomaly that has to be eliminated. What, what are the central policies uh, for which law and justice uh, is uh, fighting in Poland right now or in the last few years? Give, give us uh, well, some uh, examples of conservative policies that, uh, that, that, that make you so dangerous and so upsetting uh, that, uh, that the consensus politics mm -hmm. in Germany or other countries has to say, no, these, they must be eliminated, as mm -hmm. you say. Well, let's 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 start with the social policies. I mean, we defend family, family understood or marriage understood as a union of a man and a woman, which is of course bad enough. I mean, now nowadays there is something you you it's it's not acceptable. I mean, they are, the the Western politicians are going berserk when they hear that a marriage is a union of a man and a, and a woman. It's called a restrictive. A restrictive definition of uh, of, uh, of of marriage, uh, but also uh, in in foreign policy, uh, for example, we have managed to uh, organize a, a loose coalition of East European countries, a Visegrad group, right? The V4 group, it's called. But there are more than four countries. And for the first time, Eastern Europe uh, uh, has begun to play a more or less independent role in European politics. Until that moment, we were seen as uh, kind of junior partners uh, by the big guys, by Germany or by France. They said, well, yes, uh, you are our friends, but uh, uh, you are allies, we like you, we respect you, but you have to learn a lot. So we will tell you uh, 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 what to do. There was a, a famous saying by, uh, I think it was uh, Jacques Chirac, uh, uh, La Pologne a perdu l'occasion de se taire. That uh, Poland has lost the opportunity to shut up. So, so that, so that, that <laughs> so that, that, that was the, the, the attitude. I, uh, I met uh, um, uh, Chancellor Merkel uh, several times. Uh, uh, I accompanied Mr. Kaczynski, right? He was meeting her and, and I was with him. And she's a very nice, very shrewd politician. But you could hear, you know, that you could hear her say, uh, well, we are friends. I mean, why did you do this without consulting us? But when they do <laughs> something, they do not consult us. I mean, Germany does not consult Poland. But they, they're slightly angry when we do something with the consulting, uh, uh, without consulting her or, or Germany. They talk about internal affairs of Poland and they do not feel any inhibition in making it public. I mean, it's obvious that they will have a lot to say in Polish politics. And then the law and justice government is the first governor who said, no, I mean, you are our partners, let us negotiate, but we have also our interests and we will defend our interests. And that makes them very, very uh, irritated. But also one of the most notorious uh, uh, cases was the, the reform of the judiciary that we made. And now, there is nothing nothing extraordinary about this reform, nothing which you cannot find uh, in uh, uh, Spain or France or Germany or Italy. I mean, nothing really. What, but, what, what, what was the reform? This is, uh, this is uh, the first thing that we hear about Poland when someone wants to talk about autocracy in Poland is mm -hmm. tampering with the independent judiciary. So what, what, what was the reform? 
there is a body which is called in the, the, the Council of the Judiciary, the National Council of the Judiciary. It exists in many other countries uh, in Europe. They are responsible for uh, nominating judges. And, uh, and until, until the, the reform, uh, this body was entirely uh, under the control of the lawyers' organization, like uh, in America, it's American Bar Association, right? So, so imagine in the United States, American Bar Association nominates the, the members of, uh, of the Supreme Court. And we said, no, that cannot be happened. I mean, because uh, it's not, it's, it's a political body. You have to elect those uh, uh, judges politically. That is, there has to be 70% of the support of the parliament, which means that's not the ruling party, but there has to be a larger coalition of parties who, that agree on this candidate. But it cannot be the lawyers that appoint lawyers to the uh, institutions of the judiciary. Uh, usually it's uh, well, lawyers, nominated lawyers, uh, or a lawyer's organization, it's usually a kind of, you know, buddy-buddy, uh, uh, or, or, uh, or even if not that, it's usually one uh, dominant uh, legal philosophy that, uh, that takes the power and, and controls the body. Whereas we, we believe that the National Council or the judiciary uh, should be representative. And now it is representative. The same with the media. We have, uh, the ambassadors want to talk about the freedom of media. We had about 70% of the mainstream media and 30% of conservative media. And this is scandalous because we have 30% of conservative media. There shouldn't be any conservative media. Uh, the German uh, ambassador become, be, becomes very angry. Uh, but in Germany, in Germany, is Germany is the country of one opinion. All the media, and also France, all the media are the media of one opinion. It's the, the mainstream opinion. That is, the conservative voice is not heard. It's the mainstream that is where, and what is mainstream? The mainstream is the left and the right, except that it is the left that uh, has the uh, <clears throat> political agenda, and the right uh, has already capitulated. Well, this is obviously something that we've seen in uh, in the United States and the United Kingdom and various other countries increasingly in 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 the last few years it's uh, we we've moved from conditions in which it was assumed that there are two legitimate sides let's say a liberal a liberal and a conservative side or a labor and a conservative side and that those sides would uh, take turns in the in political struggle. Sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. But if you lose, then you grant legitimacy to the side that won. And when they lose, then they grant legitimacy to you. And at some point in some somewhere around 2016, um, that seems to have fallen apart, both in America and, and in the UK. We're seeing it in Israel as well, and I think in other countries. Now the the rules of engagement have changed. Now, if the conservatives win, then they've done something illegitimate. They're not supposed to win. And then there's a resistance. Then there is a condemnation uh, that uh, uh, authoritarianism is coming and extraordinary measures need to be taken to stop it. Obviously, if this continues, then we, we will see the, the disintegration of uh, of the great democracies of the West, which are built on a liberal, a liberal party and a conservative party that are that are legitimate, and so what what you're telling us, uh, Richard, is that uh, that primarily what what we are reading about Poland is a description of a conservative party that is attempting to break the monopoly that liberalism has on. Uh, or had on the judicial system or on uh, in in the media, and this is uh, a painful change for liberals who thought that such a thing was not going to happen again. 
Yes, that is exactly uh, right. If you read uh, uh, major newspapers, uh, what they report about Poland, they never bother to show the other side. I mean, uh, uh, the, the, the Law and Justice Party is a very, I would say, intellectual party. That is, there are many intellectuals who have uh, some ideas, uh, not, only, not only are they after power, but also they have some uh, ideas. And there are some good arguments. We have an interesting story to tell. And our story or our stories never make it to the uh, major media. You will not uh, hear uh, what we uh, say, uh, what we have to say. It's, it's uh, what you read is a, is a typical newspeak language. The uh, nationalist, conservative, authoritarian government from Warsaw has launched another uh, attack on the freedom of media or on the independence of the judiciary. That must stop. And now we talk to uh, <laughs> the same, they talk to the same people. And the result is that when you read New York Times, Washington Post, uh, Le Monde, Neue Zürcher Zeitung, the Deutsche Zeitung, El País, there's the same story everywhere. And then uh, people who live outside Poland are perfectly uh, in a position to ask themselves, are they all lying? I mean, that's impossible. It's impossible that all the media in France, in Germany, in the United States lie. That cannot happen. Well, it is possible. It is possible, not that they lie uh, deliberately, but they, they live in the same world with the same language, the same cliches. They quote one another, you, uh, you know, they seek one another's opinions and they are not, not interested in, in the other side. And they are not interested in, in, and the more they ignore the other side, the less they are interested in uh, hearing what they have to say. They know we are wicked people, so why should, uh, why should they should talk to us? You have a very long career that goes uh, all the way back to, uh, to publishing an uh, underground uh, magazine, an illegal underground magazine under uh, communism before the, before the fall of the Berlin Wall. And so you you got to see uh, both the the resistance movement that that uh, that was trying to gain uh, an independent, a free Poland, and the transition from communism to liberal democracy. And uh, for those who are familiar with your 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 intellectual work, uh, you 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 made a, quite a splash intellectually in uh, in the English speaking world. Uh, in 2016, with the appearance of uh, of your first book, I think in English, uh, the the Demon in Democracy, um, which talked about the uh, how close liberal democracy and uh, and uh, Marxist ideology actually are. Now, this is almost heretical. I shouldn't say almost. It's it's really kind of a heresy, uh, even for conservatives in English speaking countries, uh, we all kind of grew up on on Friedrich Hayek and the uh, the idea that uh, liberalism and Marxism are polar opposites, that they, you know, th that they're absolutely antithetical uh, types of ideas and of political movements, with the Marxists being the bad guys uh, and the liberals being the good guys. And yet you begin uh, the demon in democracy by describing this transition in which uh, many communists stayed in power and switched allegiances and simply became liberals. And uh, this is the beginning of a, a, an extremely interesting, I have to say, nuanced, sophisticated, careful comparison. You don't obviously say that you know liberalism is marxism or that liberalism is bad as marxism uh, it's a it, it it's a work of careful scholarship in which you nevertheless show that structurally there's a reason why marxists communists who had been governing poland under a totalitarian regime were able to easily slide into governing as a liberal regime 
Can you help us understand what possible similarities can there be between Marxism and liberalism? Well, there are many of them. The first similarity was that uh, uh, the new liberal democratic system started with the very strong message, we have to restructure everything. Uh, we cannot have the society as it is. It's backward, it's, it's traditional, it's conservative, it's religious. Uh, no, no, we have to reorganize it. We have to restructure. And there was very similar rhetoric to what my parents had heard after World War II, when the communists took over. Their message was very similar. We have to modernize the society. You cannot, we cannot have the society as it is. Everything has to change. So uh, then I understood that what makes those two ideologies very similar is that they are not about uh, freedom. Liberalism is not about freedom. Uh, communism is not about equality. They are all about social engineering. I mean, a very profound restructuring of the society. And not only institutions, uh, not only economy, but everything, including the way you think, the way you, uh, the way you speak. You have to, they have to re replace your mind with a new one. They had, there was this, this, <laughs> there was this, this phrase, a new man, homo novus in Latin, right? We have to, we have to create a new pole, a new man exactly like communists had done a couple of years, decades before. Uh, and, uh, and it's obvious that when you come up with a program like this, a lot of people will resist. And they say, no, no, I don't want to be restructured. I'm quite happy with my mind. And, and they begin to resist. And what uh, do the uh, liberals do? They said, we will have to reform you, right? We will, uh, <clears throat> we will teach you, we will indoctrinate you, we will take your children from you and send them to school and the school curricula will be such that your children will be new Poles. They will be new men, not like you, you yourself, who are, uh, uh, actually belong to the dustbin of history, right? Uh, uh, so uh, the more people resist, the more aggressive becomes the ideology to change, to modernize. Uh, uh, and, and that's why my, my feeling is that uh, liberalism uh, attracts uh, less intelligent people, as conservatives attract more intelligent people. Uh, of course, there are exceptions, and uh, we, we know that. Uh, but uh, I think it was John Stuart Mill who called the Conservative Party a stupid party. I think, I think the Liberal Party is a stupid party because they have this easy solution. I mean, they, they buy everything that's uh, new modern uh, and they accept everything that uh, uh, destroys what is uh, uh, old, uh, uh, what is traditional, what is classical. So uh, it's an invitation to all kinds of barbarians, you know, who don't have to learn about the past. You don't have to uh, learn about the group or the national experience or, or the European experience uh, uh, for the matter, they know that, uh, well, everything will go, uh, will wind up sooner or later in the dustbin of history and the new thing will be created and everything new is good. So we stand by the uh, modern, uh, the new. So uh, uh, I'm speaking now jokingly, but uh, it may be very painful uh, because this, this propaganda, this indoctrination, indoctrination becomes uh, more and more uh, intrusive, uh, aggressive, offensive. 
uh, especially to people who are conservative. If you are conservative, you have a lot of uh, attachments to things which you uh, consider noble or sacred or respectable. And then uh, come these uh, barbarians and they spit on it, you know, and they say foul things about it. They want to humiliate you. I cannot humiliate them, even if I try, because you cannot humiliate a barbarian. Uh, but they, but we are easily to be hum, hum, We are very easy to be humiliated. One of the, I think, most uh, poignant and moving uh, parts of the book, uh, "The Demon and Democracy," uh, is when you describe the realization uh, that the things that you and your that you and your friends were struggling for, fighting for. Uh, ri risking jail and maybe your lives for in the underground, those things were actually things that didn't have very much to do with this vision of a a, a new liberal society. Uh, you say that what 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 were we struggling for? We we were struggling for patriotism, uh, national traditions, uh, and our religion. Uh, in, in other words, the 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 inheritance from the past. And you say that for, for Poles, the freedom that you dreamed of under communism, the freedom you dreamed of was the freedom to be able to be patriots, honoring your national traditions and, uh, and your religious her her heritage. And so what happened is that that was all illicit and illegal under communism. And then you move into liberal democracy, which you emphasize is, is, is not as bad as communism, but still the structure that says our goal is progress. Our goal is to eliminate the past for the sake of modernity. All of the pressure that, that the society brings to bear is still focused as it was under Marxism in eliminating your patriotism and your religion and your national traditions. Have I described that correctly? That is, yes, that's a, a further description. Uh, yes, a lot of people were against communists for a lot of reasons. It's not uh, liberal democrats versus communists. Uh, there were uh, farmers, peasants, uh, uh, the Catholic Church, uh, uh, of course, uh, the nationalists, uh, uh, patriots, uh, people from... Uh, a long uh, tradition of Polish intelligentsia, uh, people who are very much attached to high culture and so on and so on. And we somehow hoped that these things will be uh, uh, preserved and respected uh, once the old regime disappears. Uh, but if you, uh, if you want me to say uh, why the, the majority of the Poles disliked communism, or rejected it, and rejected it was because communism was considered to be foreign. That was, it was brought to Poland on the Soviet tanks. Of course, we had our homegrown communists, but it was, uh, it was brought from outside. It smacked of occupation, which it was for a time, for, for some time. And then, uh, because it was atheistic, very aggressively atheistic, with the destruction of churches, vandalization of churches. And that offended those. Okay, the old regime fell, we have liberal democracy. What happens? Not only uh, is uh, uh, patriotism uh, not terribly uh, respected by the uh, new I ideology, uh, but we have well, we joined the European Union, which is, of course, not the Soviet Union. But as in the past, we are dictated to by the guys from outside who are completely unaccountable to the Polish voters who do not care about Poland, who do not know much about Poland, know next to nothing about Poland. But they are trying to pontificate to us. They are lecturing. You must do this, you must not do that. And then uh, 
people, a lot of people like myself became uh, angry. We, we don't want the continuation. Of course, it's of, of, of this uh, brutal uh, interference into what we are doing. I know it's more civilized. Uh, I, I can be a member of the European Parliament and I wouldn't have become the, the member of the uh, Soviet uh, Supreme Council, whatever. Uh, but also, uh, atheism in a new version has been coming to Poland too. In mean, the last uh, days in Poland, we have seen massive uh, vandalization of, of, of churches and uh, uh, anti-church uh, anti uh, uh, manifestations uh, supported of course by uh, by the the comrades of the pro protesters from other countries so uh, uh, yes uh, history repeats itself it's not it's not the same you have to be aware uh, of the differences because uh, you must uh, understand the new mechanisms in order to fight them you have to it's not the automatic repetition of what happened in the past, but the tendencies are quite uh, similar. Uh, this uh, uh, aggressive secularism, which uh, is now considered to be the mark of the enlightenment as it was in the, in the past. Only, only un uneducated, old, illiterate, stupid people believe in, in God. If you are an enlightened person, you uh, you despise uh, religion, you, you despise the, the churches, you despise the, the, the Bible. Well, the, the, the current uh, struggles that you're describing, if I'm not mistaken, they are uh, in consequence of uh, Poland adopting more uh, restrictive, uh, a, a more restrictive legal regime uh, with respect to uh, abortion. So it must be that uh, that liberal Europeans come and they say to you, um, you know, just as the liberal media in, in in America does, well, you're you know you're violating human rights. You are uh, uh, it, it 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 it's a universal uh, that uh, we understand that all civilized people allow um, uh, unrestricted or, or 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 not very much regulated abortion in society. And uh, and here comes Poland and says, no, we do it a different way. From your perspective, you're fighting for your independence. From their perspective, you are uh, uh, taking away the uh, the universal human rights of uh, of the citizens of Poland, and they must protect them. H how do you respond to this? Well, first, abortion is not a human right. Abortion is not a right. Uh, and uh, what happened in Poland was the constitutional tribunal made a ruling on the existing law. And the existing law is that uh, abortion is, uh, was allowed in three situations. First, a mother's life was in danger, rape. The third reason was uh, eugenics. So I mean, the fetus uh, uh, is not... Uh, entirely healthy, right, or normal. Now, 95% of these cases were the cases of uh, uh, children uh, uh, with Down disease, the Down syndrome. And uh, uh, so there was a movement in Poland to uh, review the the ruling, the, the law as it is. And, uh, and the, the constitutional tribunal said, uh, and the ruling couldn't be different when you look at the Polish constitution and the tradition of the ruling of the constitutional courts, no matter what the composition is, that it is not in accordance with the Polish constitution. It, it's not about this. These protests, I think, have a larger meaning. I mean, this is, these are the, the, the groups that uh, uh, deny the legitimacy of the uh, conservative politics and the conservative uh, or traditional, I would say, or classical anthropology. Uh, 
be, because they 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 believe that uh, the abortion is only uh, is only a problem for a woman, right? And the woman can decide. It's her body. Uh, it's like uh, having a finger um, amputated or extracting a tooth, right? I can extract even a, a healthy tooth if I want. It's nobody's business. Of you, I won't cut off my finger. I just can do it. I don't like my finger. Uh, but it's not like that. The anthropology is different. Uh, uh, I mean, there's a there's a human being. There's a human being there, and uh, this human being has to be protected. That's it. Uh, the uh, those who uh, fight for abortion, do not want to talk about this human being, the, the other human being. I mean, this, that's why they talk about the rights. If I have a right to do something, nobody is in the position to question what I do with my right. But we say, no, it's not the right. Because it's somebody else who is involved there. And if we, if we look at this, uh, this conflict between um, uh, liberal and conservative views, in in in, in some way, it's uh, familiar from the United States and from other countries uh, that that uh, uh, liberals want. Uh, uh, many of them would like to advance to uh, the maximum autonomy uh, of of the individual wo woman and uh, more traditional, uh, generally religious. Uh, thinkers and politicians are, are are interested in protecting uh, the un unborn child to a greater degree. But here, we we see something new because uh, Poland is uh, in fact moving in, in in a direction in which the entire country, or not the entire country, but but the country as a, as a whole, is asserting its uh, self determination, its national independence. And saying, we have the right to have a conservative country. We have a, a right to have a conservative democracy. It doesn't have to be a liberal democracy. I, I, is is that a fair way of of describing the conflict between Poland and uh, and people who are visiting from other countries and trying to pressure you to be something that you're not? Yes, I think it's a fair way of describing what's uh, happening. Uh, uh, usually, a lot of people believe that uh, if you have a democratic system, uh, then uh, in every country you have the same dominant ruling ideology uh, and very similar systems of, of law. Uh, and if you look around, it's pretty much true uh, in many countries we have the same ideology but there are some countries they say no i mean a different tradition a good tradition when i was uh, a student the question of abortion was one of uh, favorite debates uh, themes for debates are you for abortion or against abortion? And there were endless debates. Nobody dares to debate about abortion nowadays. You must be in favor of abortion. If you are against, you are a very dangerous person who should be uh, marginalized, eliminated. And if you are a government that's against abortion, you are a public enemy number one. So is uh, capital punishment, uh, same-sex marriage. These are the uh, uh, sacred uh, ideas which have given rise to a new uh, type of political fanaticism. You, you, uh, the different opinions are not about it, are not accepted anymore. Now, when we speak about the new fanaticism, uh, I have to ask you about uh, uh, about what's been taking place in the United States. Up and until now, we've been discussing uh, the uh, similarities, the transition from 
uh, from a Marxist government to a liberal democracy and uh, uh, observing the way in which that transition took place surprisingly smoothly uh, in in Poland. Right now, in uh, this summer, we've been watching uh, some kind of a similar transition in many of the leading institutions uh, in the United States, where uh, some some kind of a new ideology, uh, I, I would say it's an updated Marxism, but uh, uh, others prefer to call it uh, woke ideology, uh, has succeeded in uh, becoming, becoming dominant hegemonic in a very, very long series of uh, institutions, liberal institutions in the United States. Uh, and it is aggressively pursuing uh, domination first of the Democratic Party and then ultimately attempting to to become hegemonic in, in American society as a whole and in other democracies. How, how, how does your uh, thinking about these subjects for so many years. Uh, how how do you feel about what it is that uh, we're we're watching in the United States, and and can you uh, give us some insight into what you think is happening? I'm particularly worried about it because they have managed to capture the language. If you listen to those uh, guys in the states or here. They will, they will be talking about uh, freedom, about uh, equality, about tolerance, about pluralism. And what they are doing is the exact opposite, uh, the exact opposite of, of it. And uh, somehow people have accepted this uh, uh, language. As I said, it's become so corrupted. Uh, the, the human rights, uh, for instance, right? They're talking about the rights. Uh, everybody's talking about human rights now. And we are living in society, not my society, but things, of course, are not secure here, that you can say less and less. You can do less and less. The, the conservatives who are trying to uh, preserve some degree of decency or civilized discourse and secure large areas of freedom are called authoritarian, conservative, racist, right? Whereas the, the, the guys who are taking away our freedom, who corrupt the language, who indoctrinate our minds, are, are being associated with uh, freedom, with all the, 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 the good things. Uh, I, I believe we are entering the, the phase of the new despotism. Uh, I was born under the old despotism. I saw the old despotism disintegrating. I saw the beginning of a new system. And now I'm witnessing how the new despotism is being born. But it's not only here, it's, it's elsewhere. What happened to the United States? Why is this woke uh, uh, ideology going wild? I mean, r r racism, I thought that um, American society, if you can if you can show the society that has made tremendous progress from racism, I mean, this is the American society. And nowadays, everybody's obsessed, everybody's a racist in, in the United States. People are, are being accused, uh, 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 literature is being destroyed, right? Everything is being uh, rest restructured. Uh, uh, censorship is going wild and this is this is not normal so we have to call a spade a spade this is a new despotism and we we are the freedom fighters we are not the authoritarians we are the freedom fighters and uh, if uh, they beat us if they defeat us god have mercy on the mankind amen i uh uh, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about your new book. Uh, you have a book coming out uh, in, uh, in just a few weeks called The Cunning of Freedom, Saving the Self in an Age of False Idols. Uh, and unlike the previous book, uh, which which came out in, in, in English, this new book in English, you can 
uh, pre order pre order it already on on Amazon, so it's a, it's available. The Cunning of Freedom. This new book is um, a, uh, a a much more uh, detailed and careful discussion about the varieties of freedom, about uh, the mistakes that people make in talking about freedom, and about the kind of freedom that that you propose as a as a conservative freedom. So the 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 book begins with a uh, with the question of uh, pe people say that they want to have as much freedom as possible. We actually hear this all the time that that progress is being made because people have ever new freedoms, ever more freedom. And uh, you begin by asking with this wonderful image of Robinson Crusoe on the island, uh, and you say, "Well, look, here is someone who has maximum freedom. There is no one." to stop him from doing anything he wants to do. And yet at the same time, uh, we all understand that, uh, that that kind of maximum freedom makes you uh, uh, lonely, that, that maximum freedom leads to loneliness. And loneliness leads to uh, all sorts of other social pathologies. People don't want to be lonely. People want something else. And uh, in your book, you propose a way to distinguish between uh, the uh, what you call the uh, the minimal self or the weak self, and the strong self that can exist under a different kind of understanding of freedom. The book is uh, Richard Legutko, The Cunning of Freedom. You can pre-order it now on Amazon and other booksellers. Richard, I, I very much look forward to uh, ha having having the printed book in my hands and to uh, to seeing the debate around it, thank you so much for joining us uh, this evening. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for another episode of NatCon Talk. Don't forget to like and subscribe and hit that notification button so you don't miss us next time.